hello everyone. Once again, John McElroy here, one of your hosts for the Florida Aviation Network. And we are broadcasting live and in the clear from the Aerospace Discovery at the Florida Air Museum here at the Sun and Fun uh, Complex in Lakeland, Florida. We're at the 44th annual Sun and Fun Fly-In and Exposition, and what a day we have. We've got a tremendous lineup of guests uh, that we're going to be speaking with. We're going to be out on the flight line uh, listening to the noises and smelling the, the smoke fumes and watching the airplanes fly on a fantastic April uh, afternoon here in Lakeland. So I'm very pleased to have our next guests. It's KT Bud Jones and her husband Sid. Welcome to the show, you guys. It's well, nice to have you. Thank you. you. Thanks for much. having us here. This is a great day to be at an air show today. Isn't it? And uh, what a week already. You know, we had some rain in the beginning. It knocked all the pollen down. Yes. Now we've got the grass is green. The sky is as blue as it can be. And uh, and now we're here talking about your book, Nihiha. 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 Thank you. I, you know, I knew I'd get that wrong, right? Nihiha Zero. And uh, I cannot wait to hear what you're going to tell us today about this. And so. Uh, let me know uh, what's this all about. What what got you started on uh, publishing a book? Well, we started out by uh, back in 2005. The Pacific Aviation Museum hired Sid and I to come out and help them start a museum right on Ford Island, on the island of Oahu, right there where a uh, Pearl Harbor attack started. And we were hired to come out and start that museum. We spent four years out there, and in the process, Sid found. Uh, this zero that had crash landed on the isolated and the forbidden island of Ni'ihau, which is one of the islands in the Hawaiian island chain. And so finding that, he also found the history and I helped him with the research as we helped develop this incredible museum, which is now open and it has hundreds of thousands of square feet of, of ramp space and hangar space filled full wow. of aviation history. Because wow. you know, you know, the Pacific, is all about aviation history. And there hadn't been a museum there yet. So I we spent wait. that four years doing it. And that's when Sid found out about this one missing zero that was a, unaccounted for. Right, there was a listing of all of the airplanes that were shot down during the attack on Pearl Harbor. There were 29 Japanese airplanes that were shot down. A few of them were zeros, which at the time, of course, was the, the most advanced carrier-borne fighter in the world. It certainly exceeded in performance anything that we had at the time and anyone else. So when we were building the, the, the exhibit ideas for the museum, obviously you want to express both sides of the conflict. And we, we had access to the American side, obviously, but there wasn't much to support the Japanese side of the story. We wanted artifacts that, that would do that. And so I began researching what happened to all these 29 airplanes that had been shot down. Well, the short tale is, is that after they were investigated, uh, by and large, the wreckage was scrapped uh, during the early parts of the war. There were a few GIs, of course, that snipped off bits of uh, fabric or pieces of metal to keep as souvenirs, and some of that stuff's ended up in museums. But largely, the, the entire wreckage of the airplanes, which uh, as you can understand, were shot down near their, their uh, targets, which were military bases on Oahu. The wreckages were immediately recovered, evaluated, and then scrapped. But I couldn't find out any information about this one zero that made it to the island of Nihiao. And as Katie said, it was a, a remote, privately owned island that had no contact whatsoever with the rest of the Hawaiian island chain at that time. So what happened to this zero? Did it still exist? Did parts of it still exist? Was, uh, was it possible to go out there and look for it? Those are all questions that we couldn't answer right away. Well, Sid, let's, dr let's drill down a little bit. This has kind of taken me in, in, in a particular area. Who was the original, where did 29 come from? And then what was it about the one? Where, was that a, a, from the gunners that had reported in and they, they said, oh, we've got 29 or we, we we saw 29 airplanes, we saw it on radar. Where did that number come the from? The number came from a variety of sources. Obviously, they had the physical wreckages of quite a few of those airplanes. And you're talking about the initial wave of the, the yeah, attack Yeah, there was wave a, the two attack, there were the two waves two that wave, came right. in uh, on uh, December 7th. And during the course of both waves, uh, a number of airplanes were shot down by anti-aircraft fire. 
Some were shot down. Some of our airplanes actually did get up in the air and were able to shoot down uh, a few of the, uh, the, the Japanese airplanes as they were leaving the area. So between uh, our aerial forces and the, uh, the, the ground forces shooting down some, uh, they were able to account for, and as the war went on and ended, uh, they compared the records of the Japanese, and they, they concurred that there were 29 airplanes so, that did not make it back. But they, Go ahead, KT. Well, the most amazing thing is it's only about 10% of all the Japanese aircraft that were involved in the first and second wave, only 10% were shot down. That's an amazing number, considering what was going on that day between the various levels, the cakes, the valves, the zeros, all at multiple levels during this attack, and only to lose 10%. That's an incredible story right there. It was a there. really successful attack, wasn't yeah. it? It yeah. was a and successful attack in many ways. So uh, this one zero was known to have landed on Nihihau. And uh, as I detail in the book, the pilots were actually told to go to Nihihau Island. Uh, and if they couldn't make it back to the carriers, because Nihihau, the Japanese knew, was an isolated island. It was flat. It's not like the rest of the Hawaiian island chain. It's a very, very flat island mm. in the middle. So it's actually perfect for uh, landing aircraft. Where is it located uh, in the, yeah. Well, you can, might be able to see mm. it a little bit. Here's Oahu and then the island of Kauai that everybody likes to go visit. Sure. And then out to the, f uh, to the <coughs> west is Ni'ihau, and it is, as Sid said, very dry and flat. It was one of the first of the uh, Hawaiian chains, the habitable Hawaiian chain that was formed, and therefore has eroded through time. When you think of tropical paradise, that is not that's Ni'ihau. Not it, right. No, that's not it. It's flat, okay. it's dry, and it was good for farming, which was why it was developed to begin with. Wow, that's great. Uh, and uh, so, you, as you said, the, this was sort of the uh, alternate bailout for, for them. The, exactly. In, in the planning they, mode. You're exactly right. The, uh, the Japanese had actually posted a submarine to recover the crews. And they told the crews uh, that they should try to land on the beach because the submarine obviously would be a periscope depth during the day and could watch, watch for uh, aircraft coming in. And then if there was the need they would surface at night, come in, uh, pick up the crews, and then, uh, and then depart with yeah. them. So that was the plan. Uh, interestingly, there was another facet of the story that we learned about in time, which we did not know about, which is almost as important as the story of the Nihiao Zero. Uh, Nihiao was actually the center point of a report that Billy Mitchell uh, most people know of Billy Mitchell, the, the great air advocate uh, back in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, he actually explored the Pacific and visited various countries in the Pacific Rim to decide what their uh, world perspective was. Uh, and he learned Japan was becoming much more uh, aggressive in its perspective about trying to uh, accrue territory and uh, raw materials. And he kind of sensed that there was upcoming conflict coming. And he wrote a report back in 1925, a 323-page report, that stated that the next war that America was going to be in was actually going to be with the Japanese. The this is 1925. And he, in his report, he actually said that the war would start when the Japanese came in and bombed Oahu on a Sunday morning well, at 7.30 in the morning. Right. Because he saw our our uh, readiness or lack of readiness, particularly on weekends, and how we, we uh, operated out in, in Hawaii. Right. And so it was obvious to him that that would have been the perfect time to attack us, and so he talked about that in his report. Well, that report eventually was absorbed by a number of the other folks in the military, and one of those people, a major brant, was posted out to uh, Hawaii back in the early 30s. And he remembered and was quite compelled by Billy Mitchell's report. Even though Billy Mitchell by this time had been court-martialed and was no longer in the military, the idea that the Japanese were going to attack at Pearl Harbor on a Sunday morning and that they were going to use Nihihau Island, as Billy Mitchell predicted, as a staging area wow. for the attack, he thought he might want to have a chat with the owners of Nihihau Island. So somehow he got in contact with the owners of Nihihau Island and convinced them that this was a likely possibility and that they did not want to have their island used as a basis for the attack. So he convinced the owner of the island, Elmer Robinson, to plow up his entire island 
uh, big checkerboard type squares with a plow, deep furrows so to keep land. airplanes from landing on it. Wow. Yeah. And Katie, you might want to give some more details on this. Well, exactly. And the, it's important to note that Alma Robinson, now granted, at this time period, Hawaii is a territory. They, it isn't part of the United States. They aren't United States citizens. And that family had come over in the 1800s looking for a place from, uh, they had moved from New Zealand, looking for a place to set up uh, their ranch and their family homestead, and had uh, met with Kamehameha IV, who was the king of Hawaii at the time, and was shown various properties like Waikiki, even Fort Island. He said, nah, I'm not interested. And then he showed him Ni'iau. Now, here's a funny story. Ni'iau had just gone through a period of lots of rain. Normally it's very dry, and much like the deserts out west, when it rains, all of a sudden, all those plants who have been dormant blossom and bloom. Well, so had Ni'ihau. Beautiful, green, lush, and that's it. I'll buy the whole <laughs> island, it's mine. Right. I can put my cattle there. <laughs> Didn't rain again for 30 years oh after my that. Goodness. So uh, it was a very flat island, and as Sid said, and it was owned by a family that stayed to themselves, the Robinson. And so for, for a general or, or Colonel Brandt, to convince Almer that this was happening, it was quite an amazing uh, feat on his part. And Almer took it upon himself to start plowing it up. Seven years he did this. He finished July of 1941, plowing up the whole island. When things started uh, progressing to the point of, of uh, war being imminent, he actually brought upon himself to um, hire or buy a clee track and have it shipped over. So it was his expense. And sure enough, it wasn't um, the aircraft carriers or the, uh, that uh, were being replaced by having zeros on the island to take off. They had aircraft carriers, but they were supposed to come back and land there. They had yeah, problems. And that didn't happen, right. Didn't happen, well, so that yeah, was a big part of it. So we're going to we're gonna go one more uh, into this. So where was the zero, and then and then we're going to kind of wrap this up and, and, and promote this book. To, okay, Because you got to hear good. it from the book and the rest well, of just, the Yeah, we don't want to give away the whole book, and actually this is a tiny fraction of the actual story. Just to give you some insights, the pilot and the airplane did actually survive. They landed on the island. The pilot landed unscathed. The airplane had a minor amount of uh, damage to it, and the people on the island had no clue that the Pearl Harbor attack had actually happened. Now he hold it right there, because I'm going to cause this to be a split story. We're actually going to pause on that note, because it's a cliffhanger. Yes, it is. Right? It is a cliffhanger. I, I can just tell that this is going to be a great book to read. So. We're gonna we're gonna leave it right there. So now he's he's landed out. He's made it safely. He's opened the canopy. He's unfastened the seatbelt. Stay tuned for what happens next. Hey, we've been talking with Sid Jones and uh, KT Bud Jones as well. And I'm John McElroy for the Florida Aviation Network. Here with the uh, the book that they've just written. So thanks for watching. We're gonna come back and uh, be right back in about a half an hour. Thanks.